Dystonia is another thing. Uh, I think the problem, and that is what I'm also going to argue here, uh, that uh, we have to realize that most of the disorders that we're looking at, so th this is just a, a few examples of uh, a stroke where you see this hemorrhage. It's, it's a huge one. Both of them are huge, uh, of course, but what I want to point out here is just the proximity of many of the structures that we have in the brain. Uh, so in this case, we have a bleeding which is sort of uh, interacting, I would say, both with the function of the cortical spinal tract, lots of other descending motor tracts going to the brainstem nuclei, but also definitely the thalamus, also the basal ganglia. So what kind of symptoms would a patient here have? It wouldn't be clear-cut pyramidal lesions, it wouldn't be clear-cut extrapyramidal lesions, it would be a mixture of all of these. The point that I'm making is that most of the patients that we're seeing are not textbook examples. Quite a lot of them will have a mixture of the traditional pyramidal and extrapyramidal symptoms. So a lot of what is called spastic dystonia, which I think is, is a misnomer, are actually patients, from my point of view, who have both a lesion of the corticospinal tract and other descending tracts, but also lesion of basal ganglia, lots of other things, which produces a mixture of symptoms so that in reality, and I think there's now good evidence for it, that if you have a stroke patient who have a hand sitting like this, it's not because of spasticity as such, stretch reflex evoked, because that wouldn't work like that. It's more like a dystonia, and it should be treated as a dystonia. And in that case, actually, I think an adequate treatment would be Botox, which is also what it is being used for. But Botox is now called an antispastic drug. I don't think it is. It should be used for dystonia, which is what it was used for originally. We just should call it something different, because people get confused. And they really do get confused. And I, I'm not going to mention any names here, but I have had heads of the neurology department at one of the hospitals in the Copenhagen area come into me and saying that they had a couple of patients who had no reflex, no increased reflex excitability. Uh, when they put a needle into the muscle and tried to record electrical activity from the muscle, there was no activity. Uh, but the patient clearly had uh, increased muscle tone when they tested them. Uh, so therefore, they decided to inject Botox anyway. And they asked me whether that was a sensible way. And they asked me basically how much Botox should they inject because normally they would monitor the EMG activity and they would inject enough Botox in order to uh, make sure that that EMG activity would go away. Um, so from my point of view, this is not a good thing. This is not the way that you should do things. This is not the way you should use Botox because these patients, if they have no ongoing EMG activity, why the hell would you want to give them Botox? I th really think this is a huge problem. So we mix these things up in a, a way that I think is really unfortunate. And we need to be much, much better at distinguishing these in order to give the appropriate treatment depending on what kind of problem the patient actually has. Yep. I would like to ask them how they know that they see an effect. What is that tool of investigation? Is it them feeling it? I don't believe that they can feel an effect in that way. If they should really convince me that it has an effect, they would need an objective biomechanical measure showing that it actually has the effect that they say it has. Otherwise, they will expect it to have an effect because they've been injecting it. They have the patient who has an expectation that it will work. So when they feel, they will feel that it has worked. The problem is, very often, when we measure these things 
objectively, we don't see the changes that the clinicians believe are there. Uh, we need the objective measures to really say that that treatment works. The other way around, we also need to make sure that the objective measures that we make are relevant for the functionality of the patient, definitely. Uh, so we need to make this link, and that's the challenge uh, from my point of view. Yes? Is there a range of motion measurement objective or not? Uh, depending on how it is being made, uh, you can certainly uh, do it in a rather semi-objective way. Uh, but it is also very difficult not to sort of uh, be influenced in some way. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, it, it's not really an objective measure, but it can be made semi-objective. 